Good evening. You are tuned to Cafe Cabaret. Cafe Cabaret is produced by Francis Domeno and is sponsored by the Middle East Cafe at 472 Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge and is televised at 9 p.m. Mondays on Cambridge Community Television Channel 66. Today's feature presentation, Comedy on the Edge. Just wait till you get a load of this.
work on a pot, you know. And uh, I got his microphone is bad. I didn't really notice until I said the word pot. I smoked a lot of pot. There, that's my friend. But uh, yeah, they smoked a lot of pot and they, uh, you know, they wanted to like write broad comments about their experiences. Um, but they couldn't. Whoa! Oh, I think the 
a Jewish carrot. So a Jewish carrot. Oh well, hopefully our audience heard. You know our audience, those 500 people, or estimated to be 500 people out there? That's what that, that woman who saw me in, um, at the door in the Middle East that day, she looked at me, she goes, she just goes, I know you. Yeah. Oh, okay. That must, have, that, that must be worse. She must have been like the only person from the audience who's ever identified themselves with me. No, she just knows you because you hang out here. But I, I didn't say anything. I just looked at her and said, oh, you know, I just like answered some normal thing. I should have said, I should have said, lady, even I don't know me. How could you know me? Yeah, but comedy is kind of like, uh, it's like, it's sort of like Jewish version of confession, you know? It's like, audience, I have sinned. Or in this case, Cambridge, I have sinned. That's what it's like. But Timbo can't get, the, get a, a video, the camera to like pan a pan the uh, seated row of empty chairs here. We can. Yeah? Uh, no, don't risk the, uh, don't risk the, uh, what do you call it? Well, let's see, I've been courting the limits of rudeness at work. I used to smile when people said things that were completely stupid and not worth any response at all. And uh, now I'm getting more bold. Now I'm just looking the person straight in the eye and not even smiling. And I'm just, you know, I'm just pushing the limits more and more to see what will happen. Now they like, someone says something really stupid and I just look at them. And they just like, they go like, they just, they go like this. They look at me for a couple seconds expecting me to do something polite. They finally realize that I'm not going to. And then, and then they, uh, and then they look away. Wait, you're gonna leave it like this? That's a horribly tinny sound. Oh, is that what I'm supposed to say, Francis? Well, thanks for telling me what I'm supposed to say. You're supposed to make the microphone sound like it's being spoken in by a human. There are some weird people around. I have absolutely no clout. I depend entirely on, his, on this guy's good graces. Yet I have the nerve to order him around. It's because there's nothing else to do right now. Oh yeah, I can tell jokes, that's true. <laughs> uh, I saw some guy with a Desert Storm t-shirt. Yeah, it's like, what next? Auschwitz t-shirts? You know? um, oh jeez, I forgot the, the name of the guy. Well anyway, Aristide was uh, here yesterday, and I was going to see him, but I missed him. But anyway, I was reading... Uh, <coughs> There's not much I can do. Well, it was good before. Yeah, Aerosmith is just 
just like Hitler. Let's see. He's black, he's Catholic, he's a clergyman, and he's trying to save his country from militarism. Sounds just like Hitler to me! <laughs> Imagine if Hitler met Aristide, you know, a conversation. Okay, that's like, a novel conversation between Adolf Hitler and Jean Bertrand and Aristide. Well, I live in Waltham and I ride the 70 bus uh, it's, it's here, it's here in Cambridge. And uh, I ride by the, uh, the Watertown U.S. Army Arsenal. Okay. First, first there's the Arsenal Mall, right? Then there's the U.S. Army Arsenal, which has a, which has a functioning nuclear power plant, as well as all kinds of other secret things. And then right after the Army Arsenal is the Arsenal Apartments. Well, that's a prime location. States of Africa. It means nothing. 
Anyway, so I'm going to start a country called, well, in, oh, in America, it's named after Amerigo Vespucci, right? So I'm going to start a country called the Federated Provinces of Vespucci Land. And our motto will be, everything must be great always, except when it's raining. Oh, 
across their heavens, Jessica Fisher, who's this green uh, minister of environmental affairs, says, um, said in a published interview that he had, quote, smoked hashish with quite positive effects. So, you know, it's like they're all sitting there starting to say all this stuff, right? So here you go. This dentist, uh, a dentist in Munich, Christian Curls, is providing nervous patients with marijuana cigarettes and a special waiting room in which to smoke them before they are treated. Other dentists are expected to follow. Can you imagine that? You know, imagine like the scene in the waiting room. It's like, yeah, oh, I'm about to get, I'm about to get a cavity filled. You know? it's like, yeah, yeah, me too. And then like sit around. Like, oh man, cavities. Yeah, cavities are weird. Yeah, you're a bummer. Yeah. And now you got this. Hey man, maybe cavities are good. <laughs> you ever think of that? Yeah. Woo. Woo. Okay, dog. I'm over it, you know. Well, Francis, I think I'm just about to uh, uh, all my last drugs. I'm going to get my cavities filled now. Oh, yeah. Well, can you imagine that dentist saying, Your breath, man. <laughs> The dentist takes a little pull off the hash before he does the surgery. It's like, oh wow, man, your filthy, diseased, decaying mouth is rotting. <laughs> Far out. And then you wouldn't have to spit out, you know, it's like rinse and just swallow. You know? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I put a little resin in this water, so just swallow it. You know, make your buzz last a little longer. Yeah, there was a big headline in Der Spiegel which said, hash. They spell it H-A-S-C-H. And I was wondering what the hell that was all about. Hush. Hush. Hush, little baby, don't you cry. I guess the ultra-efficient Germans prefer hashish to marijuana, as many Europeans appear to. Only because, you know, it's, it's marijuana and it's cheap smokable form. That's not that cheap, though. Um, yeah. Well, they won't call it hash anymore. They'll start calling it brown remedy and selling it in drugstores. What better place to buy drugs than in drugstores, right? How's come nobody's thought of this? I guess back at the turn of the century, that's where you, that's where you would buy all your now illegal pharmaceuticals. Because of that guy Anslinger, or whatever, Robert Anslinger, the guy in the 30s who classified it as a criminal. And uh, yeah, he was just trying to um, sort of carve out his little niche in the bureaucracy. Look, if you, could, if you could grow aspirin in your backyard, it would be illegal too, you know? There you go. Kick aspirin. You know, um, don't be hooked. Some people are hooked on aspirin because aspirin ex exerts a mild tranquilizing effect. And so they take aspirin every day. Um, I think half an aspirin out every day probably would do you no harm, particularly if it were buffered. But then if you cut it in half, then part of it would no longer be buffered now, would it? So you still get the uh, the ulcerating effects of the aspirin. Or what if you just chewed willow bark like the Indians did when they had a headache? Did Indians ever get a headache? What did they have to give them a headache, you know? My, my wife ran off with some, one, someone in the neighboring tribe. Uh, my caribou broke his leg, now I can't go to work. I think he got smoker's headache, you know, smoking a lot of tobacco. Oh yeah, you ever have that? That's cool, man. I used to strive for that effect, man. It's like... And then I can take an aspirin, you know? It's like, well, I was thinking about the Indians, you know? Like, you know, the, everybody assumes that it's bad to get your feet wet from the cold, you know? Like, I was thinking maybe the Indians thought it was good, you know? It's like, hey, it's cold out, let's go get our feet wet. It was that kind of thinking that put them at the head of several casinos. See, they're going to outlast us all, I'm telling you. First, they'll win all of our money, and then they'll buy the country back from us, and then they'll hurt us onto reservations. Um, but, but we won't even be around anymore because we'll, be we'll all be dead from smoking. That's right, they'll call them housing projects. Well, it took us 800 years, but we finally got rid of those pesky invaders. Now, let's celebrate. We'll, we'll keep one or two around. They'll have cigar store white men, you know. And, uh, yeah, never ask an Indian what he thinks about this country's immigration policy. They'll have the Land O' Lakes white man on the, on the butter box and uh, the Cleveland white men and all sorts of degrading ethnic stereotypes, but white men will be replaced, will be, will replace Indians. And like the football team will be the Washington GIs. Right, there you go. Now we're talking. Um, the Buffalo Infantrymen. And you'll go to 
supermarkets and you'll be able to buy pemmican and uh, elk's toots and things like that. Beer. Beads. Um, fire water. And uh, typewriters. Peyote. <laughs> Peyote, aisle three. Um, TPs, aisle seven. Um, yes. Buffalo skins, aisle four. Um, magic potion to make you invulnerable to bullets in the cosmetics aisle and whatnot. So, do Indians use detergent or do they just like beat their clothes with rocks on down by the uh, riverside? Or do they even bother to wash their clothing? Hell, just get another buffalo and got me a new suit. Now, there we go. There's the Flintstones, but really what the Flintstones are is about the archetypal Native American whose ingenuity enabled him to fashion all sorts of labor-saving devices from things in the wild. It's a parable, really. I heard that uh, Indian, the way Indian women gave, gave birth is they'd just be walking along, and then all of a sudden they would just like they would just like leave the rest of the tribe for maybe like a half hour. They would just go and just squat, just elevate, and just come back and just keep walking. Hey, what the heck, you know? It sure beats three days in the hospital, six like, months. You know, well, how about my 30 minutes of uh, child care leave? So, uh, yes. 30 leave, yeah. The half hour you deserve. <laughs> well, and then she didn't have to worry about postnatal care because it was a tribe and everybody took care of everybody else, right? A primitive form of social security. I wonder what the birth rate was among them. The birth rate among American Indians? Yeah. I mean, how many women, how many babies per woman? Well, you know what the old uh, Western, com com you know, the old, uh, the old army colonel said about Indians, Indians make lice. So apparently they bred quite fervently. They had an article recently about a study Putting about the like, birth rate in the, in the world. Where is this? Am I on camera? Well, of course you are. Why okay. not? Oh, maybe not. Let me change it. About the birth rate in the world. Different countries in the world. The lowest birth rate was in Italy. It was 1.3. The most Roman Catholic of all countries has the lowest birth rate. Figure that out. And the highest birth rate is in Rwanda, which is 7.1 7 or 7.3 babies per. You gotta help Rwanda. Help, help Rwanda. Help Rwanda, yeah. Well, you know what's a real problem is? Uh, that's because they're killing off everybody in Rwanda, so the birth rate has to go up correspondingly in order to make up for the fact no, that there. so many people perish through attrition. In the presence of natural obstacles to longevity, birth rates increase. So that would seem to indicate that in Italy, life is so good they don't have to replace themselves quite as often. Or maybe it's so bad that nobody wants to have kids. Simple enough. Well, no, it's not that simple, of course. But there are too many people in the world, and there are, it's increasing too quickly. It's a serious problem. Very serious problem. And um, I mean, what's going to happen, you know? I hate to sound like all these prophets that do or anything, but... I think people should stop having children and start buying automobiles. That's what I think. See, instead of having a baby, buy a car. That way, the world will be overrun by automobiles, and there will be not enough people left. Well, it's already overrun by both. Oh. Yes, there's 1.3 automobiles for every person in the United States. How do you like that? How, how about they, they could have like, um, they could eliminate them, but they could have these competitions where you have a baby against the car, like, you know, like a, you know, it'd be like the, uh, what do you call the old Roman thing? Where they have the, what's that? Coliseum? Yeah, Coliseum, yeah, but they had this battle between the two people that fight to the death. You mean like a oh. table battle? Did not like it? No, the... Did not like it? Of course, it was right on the tip of my tongue. I just the other day I was saying to my sweetheart, but I'm lucky. You think it's going to the stadium and you have like a baby against the car, you know? Well, a woman traded like, a woman traded her baby for a car in California back in 1980. Was that was that inspired the uh, song? No, it couldn't have been. They almost got a solo song. Traded her baby for a Chevrolet in 1978. Well, it might have been earlier than that, but you know, I wrote a heard about a couple living in the. Yeah, that probably is. That probably is what inspired it. But that came out in 77 or 78. You guys should have more of a talk show format chairs. Chairs? Yeah, interview public canceled. I know. The, the man can read his mayor of paper. Our friends should be interviewing you. And now, Indians, master of disguise. <laughs> yeah, here, wait.
This looks like a chair, but it's actually a Cherokee. A chair, a no, table. No, we're interviewing Jeffrey White. Yes, and then now you're in the back of Russ Rambo's jacket. Every fucking hack does an interview show, talk show type thing. If we wanted to do that, don't you think we would have had the savvy to move to New York City and, you know, audition and go through that whole rigmarole and... You don't have... You can see this one, though. Okay. Um, you can have Rambo. Now, well, that's true, but... You know, not everybody's picking on him, and so now... Oh, yeah, so I feel... Let's um, move on to another problem. target. <laughs> I don't think you're on camera. I'm trying to expand on my work, you see, but um, it's very difficult for Trump to uh, address. You see, uh, the public is really not interested in such a uh, subject this time. You know? uh, I feel that uh, stand-up comedy is a rather inferior media, you see, but uh, it's, it's a time it's the only uh, available one uh, to uh, such a person as myself, you see. Uh, how do you feel about that, Francis? And, uh, yeah, the host just walks away in the middle. Probably
I'll show the audience, right? Do I have a choice? Hey, well, Listen to me. He got a microphone in his hand. He's like 10 feet away. I can't take the microphone out of his hand. I can't shut it off. He tells me to listen. Yeah, like, I, like I'm going to stop listening. Well, this is sort of like the perfect, it has the perfect experimental controls necessary to elicit the desired response from the test subject. You're performing well. I mean, in this situation, will you shut up? In this situation, I'm able to effectively stimulate the test subject and uh, elicit, as I said, the uh, intended results. Certain emotional transformations will occur, and emotional states can be elicited as well. If he thinks he's trying to help, he's actually inadvertently ruining the show instead of actually doing stuff. Yes, you are right, Guru. <laughs> and now, five minutes of mouth noises by Francis Tomato. My girlfriend hates it when I do that. It's like, drink some water, you know, your mouth is dry. It's like, uh, well, pardon me, your royal highness, my mouth is dry. Well, it must mean I have a guilty conscience. Uh, Let's make up some proverbs for the 1990s, like um, the man who wears a hat deserves to die, or I don't know. I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. Um, uh, I don't know. Beware the sailor with a fat bankroll. And um, you well. Be beware of people who do things without promising. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, very good, Isk. <laughs> uh, be, be careful about arguing with a fellow who's ignorant because he'll always want to bet you. Shed some weight? He does look a little bit thinner. Yes, it's only a, uh, Just call me tiny. <laughs> He's only flying to Genoa now. He was flying to Seneca. I'm, I'm, I'm preparing for my role as Andy Devine in the Andy <laughs> Devine story. Uh, Liberty Valens! Liberty Valens! You didn't say I was Liberty Valens! I'm gonna get out of here! Uh, I don't know any other Andy Devine roles, but surely that was his finest moment. Uh, or maybe the Winston Churchill story. Never have so many... Wait, so, accentuate the uh, stomach. Never have so many been so indebted to so few. This is our finest hour. Uh, yes. This is our finest hour. How, how, how about an Alfred Hitchcock profile? Huh? An Alfred Hitchcock profile. Good evening. Can we, can we just see it from this? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you guys are easily amused, aren't you? Geez, well, let's Only by the lowest humor. We're gonna torture. Yes, the lowest we're gonna humor torture exactly. Santa's reindeer. Seek it out and embrace it. Well, I suppose if I whipped my dick out, you'd be on the floor, huh? That would be tremendous. A real coup. Yeah, but I'd need a tweezers to get at it. Wouldn't I? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you guys really are easily amused. Well, any kind of like, you know, penis humor. Only by the lowest jokes. Yes, the absolute lowest. Penis humor, for instance, very funny. Okay, penis at Mars is all right tonight. Um, See, if you practice in front of these guys, boy, you can, you can be able to go on romper room. <laughs> no, or the Andrew Dice Clay opener, you know. <laughs> or uh, no, the Howard Stern show. Hi, I'm running for Howard Stern's vice gubernatorial candidate. Can you imagine a governor's convention with Howard Stern and Jack Kevorky both attending? Hey, that would be great, you know. It's like, so, Jack, I uh, hear you're going on tour with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> uh, Oh, so Howard, I, I hear you're going to be needing my services after the electorate realizes what you're really up to. No, just for his career. Right. Howard doesn't think he's going to last to the year 2000. Hey, right. Francis. What's that? Are those testicles in your pockets? Are those your testicles, left and right? Testicles? No, those are my eschatological testicles. <laughs> They'll soon be gone. Uh-oh, he's playing with the 17 cases. Hey, what does a pornography channel have when it goes off the air? What? Testicle patterns. That's okay. You don't get yes, it. come 
about uh, how about? Yeah, how about yeah, how about um, a little head position? That was Phil Berliner at Comedy on the Edge. We will now begin our normal program. Springs, New York. Well, that'd be a lot of fun for your dollar, eh? Hey, what? 
dri drive 18 hours, you know, with screaming kids in the back seat. Mommy, the thermos is leaking. Get there, you know. That'll be fifteen dollars for parking. You know, it's like, a, no, this lot is not secured, and I'm not responsible for anything gets stolen from your trunk. All right, you know, and they heard you in there like cattle. Police helicopters hovering overhead. Hundred twenty-five dollars for this? I could go to Watts in Los Angeles and get the same experience for nothing. Thank you. You know, I could have my Suzuki Blazer and, and play a CD of the Eagles out there, and have the police helicopters and and people surrounding me with menacing intent. You know. Like, I go to the Watts Towers, you know, and then see a bigger work of art, right? Anyway, I just don't let me, don't let me ramble on like this, because I think uh, it's very important now that I ramble on for another 15 no, uh, I introduce the guest of honor, our featured performer here at Comedy on the Edge, a man who always brings a smile to your face, and anything else I could think of to say about him, which I can't, but if I could, it would all be complimentary. Uh, anyway, Mr. Brian Landowski, please give him a warm up. Well, it's really good to be here at the Baghdad Room at the Holiday Inn. Glad to see you all came. I want to let you know that I'm thinking about becoming a worm. That's right, I read the other day that worms can actually have sex with themselves. I said, how great would this be? You no know, flowers, guys, think of this. No candy, no movies, no dinner. We could actually stay home with us, the person we love the most. Ourselves. <laughs> Actually, you, you probably ever, never ever hear one worm say to another, go fuck yourself, because I can't. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm a little bit grumpy because I came home last week and discovered my cat eating my toothbrush. He was like biting it, had it on the floor, he was licking it and everything. And I said, yeah, that, that's pretty gross. You know, how long has he been doing this? How long have I been brushing with it? Thought that maybe it's time to keep him a little respect for my personal property. So I've been shitting in his litter box. <laughs> turns, out, turns out that I read the other day they're coming out with a new laxative for the 90s called Politically Correct Dog. Either way you look at it, you're talking out your ass. Speaking of being politically correct, everywhere on the subways, the buses, the trains, there's this stop smoking campaign going on. You've probably seen all the ads everywhere. My favorite one has to be the poster with the phone number on it. 1-800-TRY-TO-STOP. 1-800-TRY-TO-STOP. Whoa, let's not go overboard on the commitment here, folks. Let's not quit, let's just try to stop. I said I could do this job. I could actually, I could actually do the phone line there, because people would call in and go, you know, hello, whatever, I have a smoking problem. And I go, well, what's that? You're smoking Luckies? Holy shit, pal. You're going to kill yourself. Why don't you cut down to Camel on filters? <laughs> what's that? Three packs a day? Jesus Christ. Even the Marlboro man's down to two and a half. Speaking of jobs, I actually got fired from my first job. Worked at a window factory, you know, a place where they take two pieces of glass, put them together, seal them up. Before they put them together, I was making fingerprints all over the inside. That way when people got home, they were like, I can't wash this off! I can't get this off! Once, I actually made a butt print. <laughs> Stained glass! I got fired from my second job. I was working at this drive-in restaurant. The one the Flintstones went through. I kept bringing out these really big pieces of meat. So how about them executives over at Disney? Turns out, much to their chagrin, they have discovered that somebody has snuck in a few frames of Jessica Rabbit, completely nude, in the middle of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Think about this for a moment. These are the same executives who still haven't figured out that Donald Duck's not wearing any pants. <laughs> Been taping the Home Shopping Network a lot. Get home, pop the tape in the VCR, watch it backwards. Because that way it's like people are returning everything. <laughs> Actually, I guess uh, returns and, and that are pretty big in retail. Uh, according to my girlfriend, she says, uh, and I can't mention her company name, although your choices are rather limited. Uh, she says they have a phrase at their company called, the customer is always right. The customer is always right. So that means you can take a piece of string that you like, you know, washed your butt with, throw on a Kleenex with like boogies all over it, walk up to the counter and go, excuse me, this is a pair of jeans I bought like 10 years ago at 
your store. I washed them. This is all that's left. I don't have my receipt. I paid nine million dollars for it. I want my money back. And of course, they have to give it to you. Actually, there's a tiny little joke. Uh, I mean, you guys will all be using this next time you go into your favorite retail establishment. Go up to the counter. Go up to the salesperson. Go. Is it, is it true the customer is always right? And they'll go. But of course. And that's when you go. Well, then that's my cash register. <laughs> Silly old forgetful me. I left it here a couple weeks ago. That's my cash register. I'd like to bring it home with me. So I got one of those deer whistles for my car. You know what I'm talking about? It's a little plastic thing. You put it on the side of your car. The wind whips through it. Makes an audible tone that only deer can hear. That way they stay away from your car. Old shifter brains here put his on backwards. Now my car is a fucking deer magnet. <laughs> Got another little consumer tip for you. Don't go on carnival cruises. Yeah, I know Kathy Lee's the hottest thing ever, but don't go on carnival cruises. It's, I was so disappointed. I went on one of these carnival cruises, and there was like no room on the boat between the Ferris wheel and the merry-go-round and the tilt-a-whirl. We lost like 20, 30 people on the dunking booth alone. <laughs> happened to you when you're little? Somebody in your neighborhood gets chicken pox. What does your mom do? She sends you over to their house to get chicken pox so you could all get chicken pox together. Yeah. This happened in my neighborhood. You know, you get measles, mumps, rubella, disease of the week, We're fading out fast. And uh, actually in my neighborhood, somebody got shot, so we had to all go over to the house and take a bullet. <laughs> my childhood kind of screwed me up so badly that when I got to college, I failed child psychology. I had to stop going, because every time I walked into class, I thought they were talking about me. <laughs> Another class I failed was statistics, because I was really disappointed. I got there, and it was like all formulas and calculations and crazy things like that. And I'm like, that's not statistics. Statistics is the average high temperature in Minneapolis in January is 7. I can memorize this. If there's 16,000 people in Boston for every one bowling lane. The average worm copulates with himself 30 times a day. <laughs> College was actually pretty trying. They had to work on a low budget. But of course, thank God, they invented the one thing to help us survive. Ramen noodles. You know what I'm talking about? Those little bricks of death noodles that come with that flavor packet. These things are so hard. And then, of course, you can catch them on sale for like 20 for a buck. So I caught one of these sales. I bought so many ramen noodles. I built a house. I built a house out of ramen noodle bricks, but of course it rained. A warm rain. I built a village of 30,000. It's great. I read that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer is writing a children's book while he's in prison called Where's Waldo's Intestines? <laughs> Guess if that one sells, he's going to write another one called Wackity Whack. I chopped up the cat in the hat. One thing that's been bothering me, how come doctors call what they do a practice? This really bothers me. I don't want somebody doing practice when they're fondling my spleen. I would think, I would hope a doctor was having an experience. So that's the thing I'm looking for, doctors to have an experience. So, I really have a bone to pick with Sammy Davis Jr. Because uh, I'm thinking, yeah, he's dead and everything, I know, and I can't do anything about it, but thank you, thank you. Big Sammy Davis Jr. fan right there. Uh, he, uh, I'm thinking before he died, he could have been a little more considerate. I'm thinking, Sammy, why couldn't you have left that one good eye for Stevie Wonder? That way he could get out on his own sometime. Or at least walk in circles. Speaking of famous dead celebrities, Karen Carpenter. Turns out, at the time of her death, it wasn't bulimia or anorexia that killed her. And I'm not making this up. It was the fact that she took 80 laxatives a day. That's 80 laxatives day, a day, rather. That's like eat a burger, boom, it's on the floor. <laughs> pass the teeth, pass the gum, look out, Graham, here it comes. Kind of gives a whole new meaning to lunch for people on the go. Myself, I'm not actually that afraid of dying because I'm a firm believer in reincarnation. In fact, I'm convinced in my next life, I'm coming back as the Antichrist. Last week I discovered I could walk 
Underwater. <laughs> Actually, if I had to pick a biblical celebrity to come back as, it would probably be Moses. Because wouldn't bath time be a hell of a lot of fun? Water out? Water in. Water out? Hello, you little Egyptian. Water in. <laughs> The one thing that really bothers me, though, about the whole dying process, the funeral procession. Because you got a bunch of cars here that can pretty much park anywhere, go through red lights, go as fast as they want, leave their lights on all day. They can break any law. They have to get somewhere fast. And I'm like, what's the rush? Is he going to spoil? They're dead already. I actually saw a funeral procession the other day with only one car behind the hearse with its lights on. I said to myself, you know, either this poor guy didn't have any friends where he outlived them all. And I thought, boy, that would suck if that happened to me. So I went to my lawyers, threw up a will, guarantees that I have to be buried at night. <laughs> that way people going by, I'll go, holy shit, that guy knows everybody. <laughs> and that's about it. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. setting your sister's hair on fire would be a productive way to spend an afternoon now, Johnny. Now, yeah. you know, you're talking about how, uh, Brian was talking about how he had a job and he was fired. Well, it's really funny because uh, I had a job writing children's books myself and uh, I got fired for what I thought was my masterpiece. I need this shit. <laughs> You know, uh, there's something that most people don't realize about your post office. Yeah, I'll, I'll run that by you again. <laughs> it, it was, um, when you the ship. <laughs> and, um, you know. And the heirs of Winston Churchill didn't appreciate that much either.
I know. We'll call it Saturn. Devours his own children. Saturn. Great name for a car. We'll call it after Saturn. Uh, here's the keys to your new car, son. Oh, geez, that's that. <laughs> Saturn, because you only got one life to live. Well, I wish I had several lives to live so I could see our next guest in my past and future lives. Um, but as it is, one life will have to do to see the awesome, extraordinary um, jokes of Mr. Steven Eskowitz. Let's give him a Like, 
You know, like if it was one question, one question mark, like, what do you think? But three question mark, what do you think? Implying <laughs> that you don't, you really don't have to think at all. And finally, um, I, I was just reading in the paper the other day about the, the Republican Party is becoming split by um, the uh, religious right is starting to make inroads into the Republican Party and split it. And uh, they gave an example of this guy. His last name was Quist. This guy in Minnesota is running for state office there. And uh, he's this, like, he's this right to life for a guy. He's like real hardcore about it. And um, this, uh, this is actually true. His wife, I'm going to finish on a true story. It's not even a joke, but anyway. His wife was six and a half months pregnant and she was killed. And so he, he had her fetus buried separately in an open casket.
So, Steve, improvise. What's this? It's a log. It's a bump. It's a bump. It's a speed bump. Yes. Here in the non-industrialized third world, we have gigantic logs which serve as speed bumps. Okay, Francis. And now, I'll repeat after me, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Eskowitz. Repeat after me, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steven Big Eye Eskowitz. Rebellion. 
cultural planned obsolescence. You know, Seattle capitalism. Remember when Madonna was considered subversive? Remember like two years ago, everybody was saying, oh, Madonna's really subversive, you know? Oh, uh, four years ago. Four years ago? Mm-hmm. No, they were saying, I, I, I was hearing about it even like last year, or like one or two years ago. But anyway, so it's all like rebels. Everybody has to be a rebel. So I was thinking, why don't you rebel against being a rebel by being the opposite? Do like, they have like parent rock, you know, be like, do your homework, you lazy kid, wash the car, you're lucky to be alive. I don't know, I don't know if I should be a poet or a comedian. Poetry is comedy for wimps, and comedy is poetry for mean people. Yes. <laughs> so what should I be? Mean. Weak and insensitive. Women like men who are weak and insensitive. Or is it strong and sensitive? I forget now. Well, how about this one? They don't accept you unless you act like a jerk. But why be part of something that doesn't work? American culture, long distance tribalism. Don't look strangers in the. See, I haven't memorized this yet. You know? Like, I wrote it up at like 1 in the morning last night, you know? So, uh, don't look strangers in the eye, especially when the economy's bad. And the economy's always bad. Wow, I must have been depressed when I wrote this. Okay, how about this? So I was watching TV, right, the other night, and um, there was this advertisement for the food labels. It was put up by the FDA, and they actually said this. I'm not making this up. It said, the new food label, use it. You'll feel great every time you do. I'm not going to even try to make a joke out of that because it can't be improved upon. It's just perfection. I'm just marveling in the, in the beauty of that statement. You'll feel great every time you do. And then Dan Quayle came on in the news, and they asked him if he's going to run for president in 96, and he said, I'll make a tentative decision later this year. I don't know, are you sure you really want to commit to a line like that? Are you sure you're going to make a tentative decision later this year? Oh, I think I will. So anyway, then I saw this documentary by um, Mike Barnacle. He does like weekly, I don't know, however often documentaries. I gotta tell you something about this Mike Barnacle documentary. It was a colossal waste. Oh well. He always says that. He's like, this is a colossal waste. What about the guy at the Herald? You know that guy at the Herald that does Mike Barnacle's job? Oh, that guy, uh, Howie Carr, yeah. You know, if, if we got rid of welfare, Howie Carr would be out of business because he wouldn't have anything to write about. <laughs> it's Phil, Phil, all right. Steve. Hey, Phil. Yeah. I am not on stage right now. I am not talking to you. This isn't happening. You are not wearing a red t shirt. That's all I want to say. Well, he's smart enough to be. But, uh, <laughs> he's smart enough to be, but he's too stable to be. No, he's too confident to be. Not quite too stable, but. Well, I would tell you what I want, but I can't because I haven't figured out a socially acceptable language lie to describe it yet. And I never will and I never want to. Woo! There, I said it. Okay, so I was talking to the schizophrenic guy, right? And then, oh, there, all the practice people are voice on it. I was talking to a schizophrenic guy, and I said, God is evolution, which is something I can't when I was so with it. And he said, if God is intelligent, how can it be done by a piece of shit? I don't know what he meant by that, but... I know what he meant. I figured, somehow I figured you would know. Why didn't you tell us, Francis, what he meant? What he means is... As man is limited by shit, so God by the infinite. <laughs> oh. He has to tell me that again after I get off stage so I can write it down and tell him. He'll probably just say, whoever oh, said, he'll say, you're crazy. Something like that. Whenever you think you have something intelligent, he always just puts it down completely. Okay, I think there should be a, uh, a crime called driving under the influence.
influence of the globe. Because every time after I read the globe, I feel dizzy for like a half an hour afterward. Their motto should be, uh, never have so many words been used to say so little. There's a, there's a fair on Waltham Commons right now. And, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like a, a celebration of archaic insti you know, institutions. Little do they know, but the people attending the fair are actually like part of the display. You know? It's like, uh, what do you call it? Oh no, I can't do it without my notes. It's, oh, I didn't write it down. No. Well, I'm running out of things to say here. So, I guess that's it. Chris, should I bring up the business next person? That's my sole function around here, to introduce the next act. It requires a keenly analytical mind and an ability to memorize four names. Uh, let's see. The thing is, um, who was next? Uh, um, and then the alligator said, uh, no, that's another one. Uh, Somebody whose job it is to like get drunks out of Irish bars. You know, I got a Gary Flanagan now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want you to dust my pan. Well, Steve said something interesting about uh, songs for parents. It's like uh, I'm bugged at my kids because they don't pick up after themselves. You know, that could be a whole genre. It could be almost like Barney or something for parents. Um, you know. Um, yeah, it could be like uh, family, family circus cartoons with some music. You know what a comedian should do? They ought to get the uh, daily comic strips and read them and then laugh derisively. Like, um, Mommy, I put Jesus down the toilet bowl. <laughs> you know, something like that. Or uh, the family circus. Grandpa's watching us from heaven. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it would work. You know, the comics are never funny. Why do they call them the comics? Why don't they call them something like the dreary, quotidian, everyday observations of workaholics who are appealing to people who are like them? What about, uh, what about Calvin Oh, well, that's brilliant. Oh, no, don't say a word against it. But why do they call it Calvin and Hobbes? Do you know who Calvin and Hobbes were? Because the guy who said it was a Yeah, but, you know, John Calvin, the, the, uh, the, the Protestant work, work ethic guy, and, and Hobbes, life is brutal, br brutal, nasty, and short, you know? It's like, uh, not exactly a day at the beach kind of philosophy there. Why don't they call it something like, oh, I don't know, Nietzsche and Hegel, you know? It's sort of like a... Don't wander too close to the abyss, Hegel. You know, <laughs> everything is everything, Nietzsche. Um, okay, I did remember the name of our next guest. He's a first timer here, and um, we're mighty glad to see anybody who has the nerve to come here for the very first time and discover that uh, there's one old lady in the audience and she keeps wandering in and out at her leisure, and that's the extent of the audience um, besides comics. And um, so, if I get your name wrong, Franny Lynn. Franny Lynn. Flanagan. Oh, I thought you said J A, and I was gonna say oh, well, uh, Okay, no, I'm sorry. It's it's Franny Hannigan. And uh, being a man named Francis, I understand. Franny Hannigan. Thank you for that warm round of applause. <laughs> Springfield. I actually live in Springfield, but I grew up in Dorchester. And talk about making a lateral move in life. Yeah, my life goal is to retire to Worcester, because after all, I'd like to be a complete mass hall. And I'm the president of the Western Mass Kiss fan club. Does everyone remember Woo! Kiss? Yes. I'm talking about the old Kiss with the makeup. We got a tribute band. We're a little bit different. We wear yellow and white makeup. We call ourselves pissed, which means that we're always number one. <laughs> now, I love music, and it really hurt me when Kurt Cobain killed himself, because I really loved his band, Nevada, and I really think he put that state on the map. <laughs> but the sad thing is his wife's name, Courtney Hole, 
That's a very unfortunate name for a woman. And look what they did to the kid, the name they gave the kid, Franks and Beans. I mean, that just isn't right. They shouldn't be doing that. Ah, let's see, I'm going through a difficult time right now because my favorite aunt passed away. And uh, she was cremated. And it really got me thinking about where Cremora comes from. <laughs> Big brown jar filled with powder, forget about it. But also, I'm, uh, I'm actually blind in my left eye because of uh, the eclipse we had about a month ago. I mean, that was kind of a nice thing. I went out and I said to my friend, Joe, how should I look at this thing? What's the best way to do that? And he said, oh, uh, magnifying glass. I was like, oh, wow, it looks pretty thin looking. Oh, God! So that's a little bit tough. Yeah, and no, not even that. Not even tunnel vision. So, um, supermarkets. Why do... Why do people think it's okay to dress like shit when they go to the supermarket? Now, it's okay for the laundromat. It sort of fits. You don't have any clothes. But the supermarket, I mean, and I'm guilty of this myself. I found myself there the other day. I had on red cowboy boots, thong bikini, tube top, and a Burger King crown. <laughs> I'm comparing Skippy to Jip. Lady walks by. Oh, try the chunk style. Nobody notices a thing. It's really strange. A fun fact, do you know that the highest award you can get in Boy Scouts is the Silver Beaver? And I was wondering, what does Barbara Bush think of that? That's what I was thinking, anyhow. Let's see. Oh, there's a lot of strange stuff on TV these days. Did anyone see Sylvester Stallone on hard copy? He's walking down the street with his new girlfriend. Now, the guy's always had a great build. But it was really strange. He had all these veins in his eyes. He had all these veins in his shoulders and his chest. He had all these veins. Does anyone have the guts to tell this guy he's actually turning into a penis? <laughs> if he doesn't watch himself, his legs are going to fuse, his eyes are going to pop out, and his head's going to turn purple. And you know, if that happens, you know, you know what he's going to do. He's going to do a movie. He's going to call it Cocky. You know, it's some guy who's a real dick who's trying to prove that he's the biggest dick of them all. And he'd probably win a, an Academy Award for getting into character so well. Also, the uh, on the news, the Food and Drug Administration had some good news. That they want to reduce the level of pus in milk. I don't know about you, but I didn't know there was any pus in milk. I mean, this is sort of like hearing that ivory soap, which is 99 and 44th, 100% pure, except the 0.56 left over is donkey vomit. Doctor, Lord, every time I wash my face, I feel like such an ass. What is wrong? I mean, it's terrible. And it's ruined my appetite for certain foods, like milk chocolate. I used to like to go to the movies, get a candy bar. Yeah, let's see what that looks like. Uh, pussy way bar? Nah. Bustards? Nah. Yeah, give me the three Pusketeers. Yeah, three Pusketeers. Well, I love to I love to watch TV. And you know what it's like with the clicker? You go right at the A side of the cable and you come down to the B side. And you start doing that triangulating until you get your favorite show. It takes you a couple hours. Well, it seems like I always end up on the same show that interests me the most. And it's the one where the, the red ants are eating the caterpillar. You know that show? And the caterpillar is always the same. Fuck off, fuck off, I'm really a butterfly, fuck off. That's where I end up on cable. Let's see. Take my trusty notes here. Oh, Wrigley's has a new campaign. They're trying to sell more of their gum. The after meal breath campaign. Has anyone seen this? Yes. Yes, and it's ridiculous. And I'm wondering, what's going to happen after this campaign is over? Are they going to have an after-sex breath campaign? And you know what it's going to be like? It's going to be a scolding mother with her hand on her hip. Now, Johnny, I don't know what or who you've been eating, but I want you to try Wrigley's. Or Tabitha, I want you to get rid of that gum. It's obviously more than bubbles you've been blowing. Try Wrigley's. I mean, this, is, this looks like where it's going to be going. You'll have to work on that yourself. I'm not prepared for that. And then there was some really bad news about the United Nations said that Thailand has the worst AIDS problem in the world. And I was thinking, 
Well, is that so strange from a country whose capital city is Bangkok? <laughs> I'd like to recommend to the city council of Thailand or of Bangkok to change the name of the city to something like, uh, I don't know, Death Dick. <laughs> hey, Wang Fen, you want to go down to Death Dick and get laid tonight? Uh, no, I think I stay home, take bath. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm a person, I got a lot of problems, I readily admit that, and I recently joined MA, Masturbators Anonymous. It's a 12-stroke program. Well, <laughs> And we're a little bit different, we don't believe in taking things one day at a time, but just doing things one time a day. Our biggest issue is just learning how to let go. Very important, very important. Condoms. I think we all know that sex is a messy business, but I've often wondered, how come the condom manufacturers don't put a little wet mat in the condom package. Does that make sense? Call them banging wipes. How about thrust and dust? Poke and soft? Please, call them something. And one of the things I hate about, about condoms the most is when I have to burp my condom. You know what I'm talking about. You get it on and there's an airbag sitting on the end of it. Oh, baby, I love you so much. I love, oh, excuse me. I mean, I feel like a goddamn piece of Tupperware. Which brings up the next question, why doesn't Tupperware come out with a condom? I mean, I want a tight fit, and I want to stay fresh. To me, it makes perfect sense. Any Catholics in the audience? Yeah. Former, otherwise? Two, two, only two. Well, I'm a lapsed Catholic, and I don't feel guilty about it. I don't go to church because I feel like I was driven from the church by the way priests sing. You know what I'm talking about? Even though I'm a virgin, and I prefer the company of celibate men, and I think masturbation is a great evil. <laughs> Please come to me if you have any questions about sex, love, or relationships. Even though I don't have a real job, I don't pay rent or taxes or utilities for my food and clothing or anything else that normal people have to pay for. Please come to me if you want to learn how to live a responsible life, you fucking assholes. Even though God's mercy is deep and wide and His grace a joy to behold, don't think for a minute I won't send you sorry as to hell if you get on the wrong side of me. <sighs> I'm actually thinking of suing the Catholic Church because I was not molested as an altar boy. Because I think it put me at a great financial disadvantage relative to my peers who were. That's all. Thank you very much. I'm all set. in handy there. 
just the other day where it, um, I was at work and I was talking with Jorge and Dr. Tho and um, Saji where we're cleaning out the um, semolina bin at the spaghetti factory where I work. We were talking about jurisprudence, you know, the usual stuff. Masaji wanted to know um, my legal opinions because I'm a paralegal. He asked me if, um, excuse me, sir, in this country, to be legally blind, do you have to go before a magistrate and get a certification? I said, well, Saji, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that when we read some case law. But actually, I do. I do work at Spaghetti Factory now. It's an uh, unusual place. It's about 120 degrees in there. It's really, really hot. And um, the people I work with are from like Brazil and Cambodia, Thailand, and um, actually, I think I'm the only one that wasn't brought up in a rainforest in the whole place. And that's why they don't seem to mind the heat, I guess. And sometimes you have to work in these oven-like things that break down. And you open them up, you get gust up to 650 degrees, which is really amusing. But it's dry heat. It's not like in Boston. In Boston. You know, it'd be about the same in Boston with the humidity if you're walking around and it was like a 400 degree day. And it's the humidity to get you. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a factory. It's one of those strange places that I thought, you know, they did away with when Dickens was around. It's, it's like every fourth guy is missing a couple of fingers. You know, that's a little scary for me. But just to get a little excitement going, because I'm in the middle of the night, the third shift, where every once in a while I yell, hey, Stubby, come here. And you get a whole crowd of people headed your way. And that's kind of amusing. But I don't know. I don't know how I ended up there. Well, I do know. I listened to a, the professor at the community college, and uh, I should have listened to the professor. I should have listened to fucking Gilligan, to tell you the truth. I'm going to listen to him again. Like I said, I can't believe I had to take a drug test to get into this place. It's, it's amazing. But that's enough of work, because like I said, I've been there all night. I just got off at like 7 this morning. Well, the worse the job, the harder it is to get. It seems that way. And the lower it pays. No, it pays quite well, actually. actually. But anyway, so I was reading the, uh, the local paper today, just trying to catch up on the local trash. Of course, I went right to the police log section to see, which, see if any of my... Um, Ex-girlfriends have been paroled long enough to get rearrested, and uh, sure enough, there was one. Um, what was her name? Oh yeah, Lisa Marie Baby Coot, girl I used to go out with. She was the first girl I knew that ever wore one of those nose studs, those things. I was always trying to—I could never get used to it. I was always trying to catch her attention, going. That used to annoy her, but anyway, I read in the paper she got um. Arrested for common street walking and unnatural acts. And I was like, unnatural acts? What the hell is that? What'd she like? Put a spell on uh, Good White Brown's cow and make the milk go sour and the calves fly away? That's pretty unnatural. I don't know. It's, it's The pilgrims have left their mark in this place, I'll tell you. What else is in the paper? Oh, yeah. Bill, Bill Clinton's always in the paper. He's, the last thing I read is he's. He said that Rostenkowski is indicted, but he doesn't need him. He'll still get the health care thing passed. And um, I don't know. I, I get this. It's like Hillary's even getting sick of it now. And I get this picture of it sometime in the future, 10, 15 years in the future. She's going to be on top of her game, one of the best attorneys in the country. And Bill's going to be like, he's going to be like Ike Turner. Just all washed up. He's going to be coming to her with Hillary, Hillary. I, I wrote another health care bill. I wrote this with you in mind. You gotta go to Congress. You gotta read it to him. Read it to him. Just to say, Bill, Bill, don't bother me. Just go away. Baby, I got a gut. <laughs> oh well. That, that's all I have for right now. Like I said, I'm tired. I gotta go back to the factory. <laughs> Some pasta on vibrations. Tell me something. Is the factory 100 yards long and two yards wide? I've always thought that maybe a spaghetti factory would look like that, you know? No, no. No? Miles long. Miles long. Oh, that's cool. You must be making angel hair. Hey, yeah, that's something you can do at a party, you know? What do you do? Oh, I make angel hair. 
Well, <laughs> you know, it's like kiss the ring, you know? It's like <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you could get any job and make it into something other than what it is. Um, you know, like a comedian. You could say, well, I'm a social commentator, and um, I also attempt to enlighten and, and simultaneously amuse, which is something that Mr. Kevin Carter has managed to do in his short time on stage. Let's give him another hand, Kevin Carter. Beautiful, beautiful. Son, you're going places. Yeah, my girlfriend, uh, I say to her, baby, I'm going to take you away from all this, and I'm going to take you somewhere far worse. Well, winding down the Comedy on the Edge segment of our show, we're going to bring up our very last guest for today. His name is Mr. Brian Melvin. Mr. Brian Melvin, a, a, a dynamo. Let's, let's hear it for him. Shake the hand. No hug this week. How you guys doing? Well, you know, I'm pretty good at guess that. You get asked twice, everything. How's everybody doing in the house? Yeah. Woo! Put your hands together. Let them know. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, smoky, man. Francis, you know, in America, you can kill your parents and you're a victim, but you smoke, you're a murderer. Doesn't make sense, does it? Hey, you know, what if you smoke your parents? They, 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 yeah. <laughs> what if you smoke, smoke your parents? Well, what, well, you know, this whole thing with uh, Dr. Jack Dvorakian and assisting suicides, yeah. you know, everybody's against that. And these are the same people who buy a carton a week and smoke themselves to death. But what's right. the, you know, what's the big deal? I think we should start charging secondhand smokers, but they've been inhaling for free for all these years. Okay. No, can. Actually, uh, I've been saving the miles because I want to get a, a bike. Yeah, what's a smoker going to do with a bike? I need something to hang clothes on. And then you get a pool table. I figure about the time you save up enough miles to get a pool table, you're down on one lung. About a million miles. I can see some clown lugging around his respirator, showing it to a, showing it off to his friends. Yep, there it is. Doc says that when I get off my chemotherapy, I'll be strong enough to hold a pool. Stick. And then I can go over. And Forget about the miles, just me on a big cancerous lump. That suck as yours. Now, smoking relaxes you. I think more women should smoke. Cut down on the violence. Yeah, women these days, I don't know. The other day I forgot to take out my garbage. My girlfriend maced me. She maced me. I don't know. And I come in this walking in Boston yesterday. Some girl's beating some guy over the head with a pocketbook. And that's not violence. Yeah, the guy was trying to steal it from her, but that's not the point. I gotta admit that. <laughs> My sister, she's another one. She had a dog neutered. Her dog neutered because he kept taking off. What kind of sick thing is that? No guy would do that. A guy would give the dog five bucks and tell him to have a good time. I tell my dog when he goes out, just uh, wear a condom. If there's two, bring back one for me. <laughs> uh, she should have just saw the dog's legs off. At least have his dignity. How hey, about the guy that castrated himself? No, he really did, a prisoner. A lot of people didn't hear about it. Apparently that doesn't make the news these days. I mean, you're flipping through the paper, let's see, uh, Ted Kennedy got DUI'd and the Red Sox lost. Oh, here's something. Penis massacre in Beirut. What else was new? No, but it wasn't the paper. A prisoner actually, he, cut it, he did the unthinkable. He, he, he flushed it down the toilet and the newspaper said he may have been distraught. <laughs> may have been distraught. No, really? Jeez, I already thought happy people did that to themselves. I figured the guy was bored sitting around the house. Let's see, I raped, I painted, uh, what else can I do? I'm in such a good mood today. I got it. I'll cut my dick off. Oh, shit. See a guy. zippity doo da zippity yay hey my own. <laughs> Whistle while you work. Sick. They weren't able to attach it, but uh, they did fish it out of the sewer. Literally, before it reached the ocean, and, and it's a good thing because I'd hate to be illegal seafoods, you know. <laughs> My girl would be looking. Well, this look, this look, this look looks good. I'll get two of these. Not really, probably a Mrs. Paul's fish stick. Can you imagine the fisherman who caught it? He'd probably be on the pier. Cod, haddock, flounder. Cod, haddock, flounder. What the Christ? Imagine if a girl caught it, she'd probably be 
be playing with the twin twin. Can I keep it? <laughs> Give it to an ugly girl. At least she'd appreciate it. She probably she would. She'd probably make like an Academy Award speech. First, I'd like to thank everyone who reeled this in. I've wanted this for a long time. I did. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Dick overboard. No, she wouldn't be that killed. She'd take it home and hide it in a dresser underneath her panties and lingerie. See, you guys don't think that I know that stuff, but I do. Because I used to babysit. And I didn't exactly watch TV when the kids went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're looking at Brian Melvin, P.I. Looks like the Wilsons haven't paid taxes this year, I see. Looks like Mr. Wilson's embezzling money from his company. Very interesting. Let's go see what the missus keeps in her drawer, shall we? Come on along. I can't do it. It would be wrong. Yeah, right. What's this crap? I know. Ah, I put on a genitalia area. <laughs> you guys let me do that. You guys are funny. Ugh, this stuff stinks. I've never smelled something so putrid in my life. It's just disgusting. Offensive. to like if people would laugh if Dave Letterman got up here with the same crowd I'm probably not he doesn't get laughs anyways hey but anyways let me finish this, this so, so called routine okay what the hell is this oh neck massager boy this thing's great I haven't felt this in seven years of course I'm only 14 oh how you doing Mrs. Wilson got my 20 bucks now I'd get out of it. I learned very young in life to lie and deny. Didn't Lincoln say that? Fred Lincoln, my drinking buddy. <laughs> lie and deny. I tell the truth, they wouldn't believe me anyways. Oh yeah, I was going through your stuff because I had nothing better to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I, I drank your booze and took your car out for a spin when the kids were asleep. Yeah, all the time. You gotta be like, no one could be that irresponsible. Get away with it. I used to do it with my mother. She used to come home. I used to come home. She could. Is there any alcohol on your breath? Yeah, ma. Sure. Alcohol. Oh, yeah. Every weekend I drank. Yeah. Yeah. I even stole money out of your pocketbook and took your car out. Yep. Yeah. My mother would be like, no one could be that scummy. Think again. You guys ever steal money from your parents? From your mother? <laughs> it's not really stealing. You have to borrow a quarter and take a couple bucks. Oh, but you guys wouldn't do it. No. I suppose you're planning on replacing the change you took off your father's barrel, too. Damn right. You just gotta spread around the pennies and the nickels so they won't notice that the quarters are gone. Yeah, you wouldn't do that. I used to think I was the only loser who did it. Then I realized everyone else was, too. Where did I hear that before? <laughs> did not get that? No one got that? Did I, did I hear that before? <laughs> I used to think I was the only loser that did it. Did I realize that one did? No, explain. I'm serious. Guys, come on. Be that. Are you serious? No. You get it, right, Francis? No. I used to think I was the only loser who stole money from my parents. Then I realized everyone did it. But I don't say money. I real. I realized. I used to think I was the only loser who did it. Then I. Then I realized everyone did. Where did I hear that before? Like masturbation? Oh. Oh. You didn't get it. Oh, I get it, yeah. You guys are scaring me now. <laughs> I thought I was going to New York with these, this material. Anyone ever cheat in school? Ever did. Say MIT, 80% of the people admit cheating. I was shocked. I thought it'd be more like 95%. Yeah. <laughs> really? I just go to cheating because I'd have to whistle. You know the cheating whistle? All right. Not have the ability to get the attention of everybody in the class, except the guy I'm trying to cheat off. Like, Cross that 
teachers. Those are the ones that bust you because you can't tell where they're looking. I had this one teacher, I think her name was Mrs. Iguana, was like a Nazi god. She'd be searching her class for Excuse me! You! Come here! Look at me when I'm talking. What the fuck? Yep, I flunked anyways, despite cheating. Yeah, if the guys that sat around me applied themselves a little bit, maybe I'd... <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> I'm only kidding. You know, it's one thing not to be paying attention, it's another thing to be talking. Let's see. Should I, okay, should I go on, Steve? Sort of battering my self esteem now. Alright, let's see. What else can I bore you guys with? My sex life. You got a second? How bad is it? I fake orgasm. When I'm alone, I have to commit my hand to someone else's dick just to get it to play with myself. You think I lack self-esteem? I just joined the infection connection. That didn't go over so well. No, I was disappointed. I put in, you know, single white male, 6'2", good looking, all my attributes. Actually, that's what I was looking for. What I got was some chick. I just... <laughs> Have you noticed on the, on the love connection? No, oh, no, yeah, what do you think I was describing myself? Yeah, I could see some girl looking through the newspaper. Oh, well, here's one. This guy's 5'6". Maybe I'll get lucky and he'll smoke, too. Hopefully he's unemployed and has a drinking problem. What a score that would be. Oh, yeah, every woman's dream. Have you noticed on the love connection they, they exaggerate how many times a week they date? You know what I mean? It's his John. He's an engineer. He dates 62 times a week. Yeah, which hand do you use? <laughs> Roast beef doesn't count. I don't even know what that means. And Chuck Woolery, no, he's bagging after chicks. The girl came out to greet him, she shook him by the penis. You know, they cut back early one time. Chuck was getting a BJ. Zipping up his fly, he's like, I said two and two, you nitwit. No? You don't get it? You don't get it? You know, Chuck Woolery, two and two. They cut back early. You don't get it? Oh, no, no. Well, at the end of every show, he goes, we'll be back in two and two, the commercial. They came back early one time. You don't get it? I didn't know that you had to set it up. Ah. Let's see. One minute, Francis. Shh. Like, this is some sort of professional kid here. We get have people running up on stage and shit, and Francis is like, this is the Tonight Show. Wrap it up. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, right. What's that? Uh, the uh, key, the key grip. <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. Oh man, I'm disappointed. I thought that some of my jokes were pretty funny, huh? Well, yeah, that's true. Because they tell you the good jokes suck, and they tell you the bad ones are good, and then they steal the good jokes. Oh, yeah, uh, don't use that. Don't use that. Next one, you see, you see him telling you a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. I stole this one comedian's material. You know, they're the most touchy people in the world. I was up there doing his gig, and uh, he was rather upset he had nothing to say when he got up. And, uh, and then, of course, he went up and tried some of my jokes, and my jokes stink, so... Uh, let's see, you want to talk baseball? Uh, no? I like baseball. I don't know, I don't like baseball. But I like watching the parents beat the crap out of each other. Nothing like showing that sportsmanship. There'll always be some mother yelling at the coach for not playing a fat little son. It's like as soon as your son learns that home plate isn't a dinner special his mother made. And maybe. A batter's box isn't what players carry lunch in. Uh oh, here's Francis. Does he have a hook? I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid, brother. We're just about out of time. We're red lights. No, no! I'm not going anywhere! That was comedy on the edge. Um, well, yo, come back next week. There's more. Honest. Bye. <laughs> and so another session of comedy on the edge comes to a close. Thank all you happy, happy people for 
tuning in to our happy, happy show, Comedy on the Edge. Of course, Comedy on the Edge is recorded live at the Middle East Cafe and sponsored by that same fine establishment located at 472 Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge, televised on Cambridge Community Television, Channel 66, Mondays at 9 p.m. You are, of course, tuned to Cafe Cabaret, the ostensible title of this production, regardless of what programming we happen to be featuring from week to week. Tune in next week for more comments.